2014, I was sent as a delegate to a conference in Moline, Illinois, from the doctors from Tanganyika. And I was so impressed that uh, I decided at age 13 to become a medical doctor mission missionary. So. so that's a huge responsibility. And over the years, you have... Where did you two meet? Where did the two of you... <laughs> where did the two of you eat? <laughs> Well, we actually met at a writer's conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I came down the middle aisle, at, I think it was at a Holiday Inn, and came down the middle aisle, and the, the seat next to him was empty. He was on the aisle, and I said, is that seat taken? And he said, yeah, no, go ahead. And his leg was sticking out in a cast. And so I kind of tippy tippy tippied around his leg and sat down beside him. And I said, I'll watch out for your knee. I'm a nurse. And he said, that's okay. I'm a doctor. <laughs> and the rest is history. But little did you know at that meeting. Oh, goodness. Little did you know that your life would change to the point that it would change many other people's lives as well. You, you decided to go to Tanzania. And uh, what, a, what a change in your entire life. You actually moved to, to Tanzania, right? And what year? Right. We moved, well, 2002. Wow, yeah. wow. And then you just saw more and more work that had to be done, right? Is it just like that more and just, more to do? It, it, it grows up like topsy. And mm -hmm. we. it wasn't our intention to, to spend the rest of our lives there, but that was obviously God's guidance for us because he had... God had spent our entire lives, both of us, preparing us for that. Mm -hmm. That um, uh, I always wanted to become a nurse, and then I, I didn't go to nursing school till I was 34. And Denny was a doctor, and, and uh, we met, and we started going to Guatemala. We did uh, about a month a year in Guatemala, 10 years out of 15. Then we worked a year in Antarctica, and Denny was the doctor. From doc the jungles to the mm. snow. <laughs> and then Denny was the, the, the uh, doctor at McMurdo Station in Antarctica for a year. And then we went around the world from there. We worked a while in Crete. And I then, didn't know about that one. That's and then back, back into the U.S. And then we thought we'd retire, and we started buying. We looked for the place to live. We bought land in Arkansas, beautiful land, and uh, I prayed my prayer, uh, God, whatever it is you have for us now, uh, let us know what it is. And eight days later, our friend Mary Kitundu called us and said that, that there was a small hospital that needed rehabilitation, and they needed someone to do the survey on it, and would we go for 10 weeks to do the survey on, on Iambi Hospital. And, and what is a survey in a hospital? Well, it means what kind of shape was the hospital in? Okay, how many, what are the, the logistics? How many people does it serve? Is it worth saving? If it is, what's there? Okay, and if what's not there is what's needed, how much would it cost? Okay, so, and that particular hospital had served 175,000 people. Wow. There were 12 dispensaries, small clinics that were attached to it. So it was, it was doing a lot of work. It was doing Well, it wasn't things. when we got there. <laughs> oh, it wasn't. Oh, okay. No. And then when we first got there, they were seeing two or three patients a day. Oh, my. Okay. Two or three patients in a 170-bed hospital. Uh, after we'd been there, what, a month or six weeks, we were seeing 100 patients a day. And by the time we turned it over to the people that we trained in four years later, they had 60 to 80 percent occupancy in the in the hospital full time. Why was it doing so little, and what made the difference within just a month, where all of a sudden people we were there, people the word got out fast that you mm -hmm. were. This is before the internet even, right? Oh, know. they didn't have. There was no electricity. No. Okay. They so, didn't have any resources really, and the government was too poor to support them. So it was up to the mission to uh, reestablish the hospital that had been there. When I went out in 1958 to 1962, 
Uh, that hospital was a 50-bed hospital and was doing very well, uh-huh. along with another Lutheran hospital that was close by, 70 kilometers away, Kiamboy. And I was the doctor at both of those hospitals back for four years. But it changed after you left. It changed after that. So is it... It's is it just the fact that you need to have someone who understands and cares there that makes the difference? Oh yes, actually, there were people that would come to our hospital and uh, walk uh, fifty miles past the government hospitals because they knew that they'd get uh, compassionate care at the uh, church hospitals. Well, since we were talking a little earlier about um, some of the viruses and things going around, I mean, I think, truthfully, a lot of people do worry even about visiting Africa because of the fact that um, there are a lot of diseases and there are sometimes hospitals they think that they might get contaminated blood, et cetera, if an accident happens. So, So I have to ask you, Paula, weren't you a little nervous about spending time in a place and, and Ebola in the time you were there and everything, there has been some very dangerous outbreaks and and you're right in the heart of what's going on. So was hasn't that been a concern? Not really, because we have a very realistic take on what's really going on. Uh, there has never been Ebola in Tanzania, but they are well prepared to handle it if there is because Uganda is just right across the lake. Mm -hmm. Uh, so of other African countries. Now, Tanzania has come a long, long way in their ability to deliver quality medical care. Mm -hmm. With your help? Uh, Ours is just a tiny corner of the the world there. But the government itself has has, uh, increased their ability to deliver good medicine, and they are still working to continue to do that. <clears throat> so, which is very important, and people are have heard oftentimes, even when there's huge amounts of AIDS, that sometimes in some places in Africa, the aid doesn't get to the people who need the aid, and so that's a super important thing to pe- people to know that the aid will get to where they want it to. Oh, get absolutely! To. When we first came to to Tanzania, the the rate of transmission though the government never gave the exact statistics, but from our own studies, it came to about 17 to 20 percent. But with education, now that's half, Mm -hmm. half of that. And the other thing is the medication is available. And so it used to be that they they weren't, the government was not able to start the ARVs, the antiretrovirals, until the the patient's T-cell count got below 200. And then even though the WHO said it was 350. But mm. now, now they start ARVs the day of diagnosis. Wow. And so AIDS there, or let's say HIV there, is pretty much like it is here. It's a chronic disease that is treatable. It's not a death sentence. Mm-hmm. And the education, of course, was so important. You were there when there was this big need for education and because it, there was not the education. and. People didn't even realize they were spreading. It was, it was, it's a terrible situation. It was a terrible situation there with the AIDS. When we started, um, there, there were, where we were in the area of the country where we were, was very, very rural. And there was no electricity, no radio, no television, yeah. you know, no apps that you could download or anything like that. And so a couple of people here in Maui, uh, Ron, Ron, Ron Calvert and, and Scott. Ron and Scott. Gave us gave us a Prado, a Toyota Prado, and we put a television set in the back of it uh, with an inverter so we could run it off the car battery. And then the government had made available three different tapes that we could run, one for medical people, one for the general audience, and one for young people about lifestyle choices. And so we would go to our dispensaries, and we would run those tapes right out of the back of the van. Uh And then the public health nurse was there to answer questions right away. Amazing. And then, of course, the first question always was, will you show it again? 
And we said, yes, in two hours. And then in two hours, our audience, the audience would go from 20 to maybe three or 400. But the government had never thought of trying to do these things? The government didn't have the resources to do it. Amazing. Well, when did you, Mary Mary and Paula and Denny, when did you know about them and find out about them, Mary? (laughs) Is it okay to tell the truth? You can tell the truth. Paula arrived uh, in my second year of ministry in Kansas City. She left uh, an alcoholic marriage. She got her kids ready to college and said, I'm out of here. It was a very abusive thing. Came to Kansas City where I was, and her mother was a member of our church. Her mother is enlightened. She's on the other side now, but probably one of the true humble servants. She was a psychologist, to put it in reference, of children. When I did her service, There were hundreds of people she had treated when they were 8, 9, 10 years old. Now they're 30, 40, 50 years old, coming back to say thank you to this woman who changed their lives. That's, I mean, think of a child psychologist that 40, 50 years ahead has kids. So that's who her mother was. Mm. Paula was in the first Unity Basics 1 class. The way I remember, because I do get fuzzy at this age, but a doctor came from Texas A&M. Uh, and he was in Kansas City at UMKC, and he was doing postgraduate work as a doctor. He was already a doctor resident. Now this was post. And he was sitting in that class. I don't know why. And in the first class, you form a field of love and of awareness, and you stand, and you say, my highest intention for my life is. And this man in this field of people just holding the light, not responding, he stood and said, my intention is to eradicate childhood blindness. Um, wow. which we know how to do. It was vitamin A at the time by a such and such a year. What I remember, Paula was in that circle. And at some point, she stood up and said something about, I want my life to matter like that, in that kind of, I mean, those weren't the exact words, but what I, I was so impressed with a, a postdoctorate work. And then she's, and fast forward, she meets Danny. She, she had many other options. I will not tell all of the stories. <laughs> Thank you. But, yeah, but he was the doctor who she knew if if Danny's the one, man, we can do this thing. By that time, she'd grown and blossomed and everything. But that's the story as the minister I remember. So I met her very young. You were 40? Mm, 48, maybe. 48, yeah. I think, yeah. I love this quote that's actually here. Um, and this is a very important quote for you. Um, someone asked you, why do you do this? And you said, my mother taught me that happiness is living a life that, that matters. matters. And Dennis answers, because it's a challenge and it's worthwhile. And there's many people who travel for all kinds of reasons. But you decided to travel to do something that mattered. And because it's a challenge, it was worthwhile. And, you know, it's interesting. I was actually thinking about this this morning. The problem with doing this kind of work where you go to places where it's most needed is it seems like sometimes it's never enough because there's always more. And now we're hearing about this new virus and things, but there's always more work to be done. And so it's not like it's ever over, is it? It's not like you can just say, okay, enough. (laughs) I mean, have you thought sometimes maybe this is enough? Uh, No. Mm -hmm. Um, When I first told my girlfriend that I was going to go to Africa, and at the time I was... Um, uh, let's see. I was in Antarctica, and she was in China teaching English. And then, and were then you in I, Antarctica with Dennis? Yeah, oh, this, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, and and, was, I, and it then was very I, cold, <laughs> and you were <laughs> very dark. <laughs> <laughs> and I told this dear friend of mine who's really smart, and we've known each other. Our mothers were pregnant with us at the same time. Wow. And I told her we were going to go to Africa, and she said, "Paula, Africa is the kind of place." where you can give and give and give and give, and it will never be enough. Mm. So you pace yourself right from the (coughs) get-go. Wow. Wow. And that means that I stay centered in prayer, that I know I'm not in charge, that God's the one in charge. I'm doing my part, but I'm not responsible for all of it. I'm just doing what God prepared me to do. And uh, 
Our motto in at Zynga is trust God and show up for work. Wow, you know, that's such an important thing when you are doing this kind of work. And I'm sure for any doctor and any nurse that's in any situation where you want to help, you really want to help. And sometimes what you can do even at your best isn't enough. Mm-hmm. And and there's and and Denny, what about you? I mean, you've been through so many. You put, do you ever stop and think of how many people's lives you saved? I don't think <laughs> really how many, but you know that uh, you are making a difference in maybe a small percentage of the population, at least. Just a small percentage, but still. Yeah. I mean, how many years has it been now that you've had the place in Tanzania? We, well, we're in our, we're doing our third hospital project. Wow. And this one is a pediatric hospital. Wow. It's the first pediatric hospital in the country. There are 22 million children under the age of 15, and there was no pediatric hospital to serve them. So our first hospital was Iambi that I told you about. We were there for four years, turned it over to the people we'd trained in and thought we'd go back to Arkansas. And then we got calls from all over the country, come do for us what you did for them. (laughs) And Did, Did you find other people? Obviously, you have some wonderful assistants. Absolutely. And I, I should mention it's IHP, your organization. International Health Partners. Slash J-E-M-A. That's our, that's our Tanzanian wing. So it's IHP, International Health Partners U.S. Inc., is our 501C3 here in the U.S. In Tanzania, we are IHP Gemma TZ, and we are a registered non-government organization with the United Republic of Tanzania. And what that means is we have the same tax-exempt status in both countries. So so doing the work you're doing, like you say, there's always got to be more, and you've done a lot that you have done, but it still needs more money always because it's pediatric. I can't believe Tanzania did not have a pediatric hospital or division of I mean, that's mind-boggling that a country would not even have. But, Cindy, you forget, um, There's, we were discussing the latest Wikipedia says 58 million people in Tanzania. She said 22 million children under mm. 15. Wow. There's one doctor for every 400,000. Talk about wait time, everybody. Wow. Wow. And what they've done is not only educate their doctors, they've got nurses. Tell them. The story about nurses is just a miracle. Mm. Okay. Well, Mary Ellen Kitundu and Denny and I founded IHP. Mary was a nurse educator. Her, her, uh, she was raised in Minnesota. Okay. And she was a visionary. When we were in Tanzania, she realized what was missing. What was missing was quality nursing care. Mm. And for the needs right then, 15 years ago, no, 17 years ago, they would have needed, it would have taken 100 years at the rate they were graduating nurses to fulfill the need that was there right then. Mm. So she knew what we needed to do was start a nursing school. All right, so IHP partnered with an Anglican university called St. John's University in Dodoma. And now... Where's Dodoma? Well, it's in the middle. Of, it's, the cap, it's the capital of Tanzania. Uh-huh. All right. Dar es Salaam is the commercial capital, but, but Dodoma is the government capital. Now, in our nursing school, we have 1,400 students. Wow. We have 600 in a BSN, Bachelor of Science Nursing Program. Same curriculum as the University of Minnesota. Wow. We have 300 nurses in a three, no we have 400 nurses in a 3 year diploma program because the government asked us to start that and then we now have we have 200 students in a laboratory tech school under the umbrella of our nursing school because that's the way you change medical care in a country mm-hmm. education 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 is what we're all about so how do they get the money they need to – I mean, of course, we, we can't even imagine what the money is like in, in Tanzania versus what we have here. But, I mean, can these people who are dedicated as nurses make a living um, being nurses? Absolutely. And uh, the government is very, very 
um, active now in providing scholarships for the students that qualify to come to the nursing school. So then the word gets out from oh, some absolutely. that go and they tell their mm -hmm. other people about mm -hmm. this as well. And uh, if the if the government pays for their education, then the government gets to decide where they're going to go to work oh, in a okay, government this, hospital. Oh, I get it. Okay, uh, what could be a better way? Yeah. What could be a better way to spread the word? So when we hear about people like <clears throat> Bill Gates and, and so many other wonderful, generous people, of course, Bill Gates worked on the malaria problem and um, when we hear people like that did you ever I know you you get by on people's donations did you ever try to go to any of these billionaires and say well uh, malaria good can you help us a little bit here <laughs> uh, we, we tried you tried and we made a, a proposal of uh, 14 million our answer from the Gates Foundation was it's too small. <laughs> no, um, actually, the Gates, the Gates Grant, that was the ASHA grant. Yeah. That was the ASHA grant. Yeah. The ASHA grant. Yeah. Oh, okay. American Schools and Hospitals. The Gates Foundation um, doesn't do little hospitals like ours, mm. even though our hospital is going to be a 500-bed hospital. Uh, they do systems. They do delivery systems. They do research. They do... Um, they do big things that governments can't afford to do. Oh, really? Wow. And they're yeah. putting in they a don't do bricks and mortar. Huh. They're doing an immense amount of research on va uh, mm -hmm. malaria vaccine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, is it is it seeing a difference? Are you seeing a difference there? Well, the the, the the broad the broad use now of the malaria vaccine. They chose five different African countries, and Tanzania was not one of oh, them. Oh, dear. Even yeah. though the research was done at Bagamoyo, just north of us. But that's that's their protocol. Mm -hmm. And so they are, it's in, it's being in human trials in five different countries now. And all the results aren't in yet. Mm. I heard also that they're working with toilets that don't need water to flush, that they're actually starting to build toilets now that they can use um, with solar power. And, and so there are people who care, but I think we here in America, especially in Hawaii, don't know enough about what's going on in Africa. I watch the BBC. There's almost stories every day on the BBC about what's going on in Africa. Mm -hmm. They have specials. Mm -hmm. They have shows all the time. I think the most we know about Africa is taking a safari there. Is taking right, well, are you and I would yeah. say, should you be blessed enough to make the trip to volunteer and support them, Paula and Denny can set you up on the greatest, most cost-effective, fabulous five-star safari at a reasonable rate. <laughs> but that's, that's just a good an, incentive. But <laughs> but that's not why you would come. That's yeah. like a gift that gives. Yeah. I do want to say what Denny and Paula understand that if God gives you the plan, then God funds the plan, mm -hmm. and God asks you to start. Yeah. So they got a plan. They got a call. Yeah. And at the time, they collected, they came to Unity of Maui in 2000, we were just, 2002, 2003. They were collecting used toilets from hospitals. They were really. They were selling our children painted tiles, ceiling, because they were refurbishing a hospital. This one they're building from See, they scratch. Were, they were doing it. Yeah, these up there. Uh -huh. They're on radio there. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but th so people gave, was it $20? They, and our kids mm -hmm. in Unity drew pictures. They sold baskets. They I raised remember the baskets. Money. You so, do. So, so tell me about those baskets. Were those the, the, you had baskets made by the local? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we people. still do. They're in the trunk. <laughs> They're in the trunk. <laughs> be at church at on Sunday. Yeah. Come at, at nine fifteen. The best them. stuff will be so out at nine fifteen. You bring your baskets with you. <laughs> well, you we bring baskets and carvings and <laughs> some jewelry and and because all right, everything that we sell uh -huh. is made by somebody who is doing something to help somebody else. Mm. Okay, and they're beautiful. I still have my baskets. I've, oh, they I've last a couple. years. They and years last. Years. They really do last. They're beautiful. So you you have you trained them to realize the potential that they can make things to bring money and to. Well, they go back let's to them. put it the other way around. They train me mm. that they can they can make gorgeous stuff mm -hmm. that I can sell, and they say, "And Mama, you are going to make a profit for the hospital on this, aren't you?" <laughs> and I say, "Yes, I am." And then they can say to their family or whoever yeah i'm helping to build that children's hospital wow. because they are so so where let's follow the progression of where you started when you first went and where it's gone and what you've built and built and built since then 
Yeah. Well, we went we when we left Iambi, then and we were uh, we were offered four no thirteen projects. <laughs> we looked at six and we chose Mwanza as the place of most need with the infrastructure already there that we needed. And where is that for people who don't Mwanza know? Mwanza is on Lake Victoria. It's the second oh, really? second biggest city in Tanzania. It's about two million people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, over the course of six years, we built Nyakato Health Center. And when we turned, and that was also a contract with the Lutheran Church. And so when we turned that one over to the Lutheran Church, fully staffed, fully self-sustained, sustaining and fully equipped. We had 122,000 active charts in the chart room. Can you explain that for people who don't understand? What well, we had we had a we had that many patients that were the, using the, us as their medical s facility. Okay. And then <clears throat> because it was while we were there, we realized that there were no pediatric hospitals mm. for children that are really sick. Mm -hmm. You know, there was no specialty place for those children, and only 26 practicing pediatricians in the country. Wow. And 16 of them were in Dar es Salaam. Oh, my. So then we started raising the money to buy the land to build a children's hospital. So then when we turned Nyakato over, moved to Zynga, we bought 64 acres of dirt. Okay, no roads, no electricity, no water. No, no water. No nothing. You're going to have water. And so it. now we have three wells, uh -huh. and we have electricity. And, and Do you use solar power? Does that work there? We have some solar power. We want to get more. Solar power is very expensive. It is, yeah. And we are on the grid, on the national grid, but the, the power goes out every day. And when, so when you're doing work in the hospital and the power goes out, you have to have, we have a generator. generator at any time ready yeah. to go on right it, it the transfer switch flips on within 50 seconds what's the worst thing you see what do you see with the children coming to you that it, that you're seeing is the biggest problem facing that you need to have help with for the pediatric hospital well, well with the youngsters they don't bring them to us until they have been usually seen by the local practitioners and that delay is sometimes fatal to the child Mm -hmm. Because by the time they get to us, they almost uh, de have died. Is it because of money or no, lack of education? education? It's malaria. Oh, malaria. All right. And the first instinct of the parents is to do what their parents did, uh -huh. which is to take them to the traditional healer, who may use a hot razor blade and nick their skin to let the evil spirits out or whatever. Uh, like bloodletting. <laughs> kind <laughs> like, of. Yeah. And... Um, and if the children are under five, the blood-brain barrier is very permeable, and so the, the malaria parasites can go into the brain. And then once that happens, if the child doesn't die, which they usually do, uh, then they are left mentally challenged for the rest of their lives. So you still have this huge problem with malaria but even a bigger challenge in the fact that you have to educate the people mm -hmm. that you don't go take them to the local healer. No, you can't say that you per can't se. Say that, yeah. what, we, what we say, all right, we do free well baby checks. Okay, uh -huh. so we get that, the word goes out. So, so they bring the babies to us when uh -huh. they're healthy. Uh -huh. Okay, and then we can say, you know, when Junior starts to get sick, you know, you're comfortable here and so forth. Why don't you bring him to us first? You don't say, don't do, don't do. Yeah. You just say, bring him to us first. Uh -huh. All right, so let's say the kid's got malaria, a cold mm -hmm. or something, snotty nose, whatever. And so you just say, bring him to us first. All mm -hmm. right, so if they've got an earache or they've got pneumonia or something, then we give them Augmentin or we give them whatever they want. You know. But we don't say, don't do what your mother did for you because she loves you so much. Mm. Mm. So, so how do you know uh, the symptoms of malaria? And can you teach the parents the symptoms of malaria? Mm. Malaria is a great masquerade. Oh, dear. oh they, yeah. We had a little boy just two weeks ago that came in with a cough and a fever, uh -huh. you know, so they did a CBC. CBC was con complete blood, uh, was fine, but his blood slide showed the malaria parasites. Wow, but you so would have can, known from the mm -mm. symptoms. Or maybe the kid just won't eat. Maybe they're, maybe they're throwing up. The, usually the first symptom is lack of appetite. But, 
But that could be yeah. a lot of things. That can be a lot of things. Yeah. And so the the good thing now is that there's a very, very effective medication called Coartem or ALU, Arthamethacin Lufentransin, that the Chinese doctor that developed, that went back in the old, old records to see what they did years Pre- previous. She won the Nobel Prize for that. Really? And and it's very, very effective as mixed with the Lufentransin. And so the two-pronged apre- approach knocks it out in three days. Wow. wow. Amazing. So uh, so, so there's such a, an element of trust and education and smarts involved in trying to help these people. And over the years now that you've been there, you've been able to learn a lot. Have you done training programs to help the other hospitals in other places to try to learn from what you've learned because you've learned a lot being in the field and and, and being with these people day by day well Our, we've we've been going back and forth now for 17 years and part of the year we spend in the states fundraising mm-hmm. and the rest of the year we go back and and spend it building the hospital that, and units that are necessary. Have you thought of doing a book, Paula? Well, <clears throat> Mary Omwick <laughs> convinced the three of us, Mary Ellen, Denny, and I, that we should write a book. I think so. Okay, so... And uh, probably a documentary would help as well. And Denny, Denny's about done with his. Mm-hmm. It, actually, it's oh, the I've editor. Had, I've done about 40,000 words. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there's all that time in the plane. It's good for writing. I'm just <laughs> saying. I've no, done a few books on a plane. And I've written about 30 pages because I tend to be rather busy. And Mary Ellen Upton died and I'm got out of hers. I'm just saying. <laughs> you She'll can download it. Mary Ellen will get what I'm she wants. I'm just saying said, you can write no on a doubt. plane. I, I mean, really, because you know what? Yeah. We're all so busy. But that time is where nothing can take you away. You're in that plane for hours, right? How long does it take to get? How do you get from Tanzania? About a day. It's a, it's from Tanzania to you go to the East Coast first when you do well, your Well, we we always take off from Kansas City because my son lives there, and that's where our van is parked. But get when you go from so Tanzania, we go, you go to where? Well, we go from Kansas City to either um, Chicago mm-hmm. or or Washington, Dulles, or um, Newark, and then we, we fly uh, Swiss. So it's oh. United Swiss. So then we go to Zurich and then down to Dar. That's a long that's yeah. all. Yeah. Or if you go Delta, you go to Amsterdam and down. Uh-huh. And if you if you go the the other airlines, uh, Ethiopian and and uh, Qatar and and uh, Emirates, then you go to Doha or Dubai and so forth and down. I mean, there's there are lots of different airlines that come. Do you get to when you in Tanzania to go to other places, or are you so locked in and work you can't travel to the other places? You're so busy there that you That's probably right. can't get there. Is the other. there. I go down to Dar, pick up people, uh, do my grocery shopping in Dar because it's a more Western place and I can get imported foods. And then it's back home. And we really don't have much time to do. So you're there just intensive work. Well, and this year coming up, we have eight church and medical teams coming back to back to back to back. Really? And then we so have. So you've been m- able to build it to that point. And then we have medical students from all over the world. Uh, the last year that I counted, we had 115 medical students, 115, residents. 115,000. No, no, no. 115 medical students, uh, residents, and fellows from 13 different countries. And wow. We had more than 150. No, 115 in one year. Yeah, okay. Oh, in <laughs> one year. Um, so, so so this thing is, is a management thing as well now for you. It's not really just even doing this, but it's managing. No, right, yeah. I don't do much nursing anymore. Yeah. Denny is a pathologist, and because of Denny's long, 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 long experience, if they have a case that they can't figure out, uh-huh. then it's go get Denny. Uh, can I ask how old you are, Denny? Don't ask me how old <laughs> I am, but can I ask how old you are? I'm 91 and 10 oh, and a half months. 91 years old. He's the oldest practicing physician in Tanzania. Wow. And you can't retire. (laughs) She won't let me. (laughs) You know, some people say retired. Mm -hmm. We say (laughs) refired. And, you know, I want to say this um, because I did marry them before. I didn't didn't want to think they just went off and slept together in Antarctica (laughs) without the benefit. But they are the happiest 
people I've ever met, and I've met a lot of people, but they, when you're around them, they've created heaven on earth there. They have whole teams. You went they've there trained and the, there. Yes, yeah. I did, and they've trained the doctors. They have the nurse. Every one of them has the heart for love and service, and then they're training them to be expertise. I think, like, you hire for that open-hearted goodness, mm-hmm. gen- and then they'll train. When they get a good one, they send them off. They train them. But they, this is the first. They've just finishing the birthing center. So they did they did uh, the uh, clinic where people uh-huh. could come, bring your baby. Mm-hmm. Now they're doing a, a, the birthing, a birthing center that will be able. The long-range plan is 33 different buildings. She was just telling me one I'd never even heard of. It. They have people who came. Now, they don't do all of it. They've held the field. There's a woman and a partner. They're coming in with a rehab center. And they've got a place that children will eventually. What was it you said from birth to work? Yes. It's a, a, these are disabled kids. No one's even oh thought about them. This is just one of 33, and they won't be doing it. They're holding vision and making sure the right people come. So that was so amazing. Just tell them that one. Well, all right. We, uh, um, we had two children that had cerebral palsy, mm-hmm. and uh, a pediatric physical therapist came out from, from Salt Lake City, and she started working with those kids, and... I call it the the mother tele tele whatever jungle drums whatever. Our cadre of children with cerebral palsy, athetoid quadriplegia, and birth defects went from two to thirteen in two weeks. Wow! We the have another nervous one. Nervous conditions <laughs> that existed with the children. Yeah, wow. and then we have Mary Pace who comes out for six to ten weeks every year. She follows uh, Don Wakefield. And she continues with the physical therapy. She works on educating each child as far up as they can go. Then my son David's job for the last 15 years in the U.S. has been to find work for people that are mentally or physically challenged or both. You put your son to work as well. Oh, Oh, I got out of his way. It's a family business. Yes. (laughs) So, and then my other son is our treasurer, you know. Uh, It's amazing. You know, you do have to write this story. And I do see a film or a documentary because people need to know because not only because of what you're doing and not only because of the need for fundraising. And if you're just tuning in, I'm talking to... Paul and Denny Lofstrom, who created IHP uh, slash J-E-M-A, International Hospital. Health Partners. Health health Partners, International Health Partners, Tanzania, but um, changing the way people understand you need to build in a situation where there's only a few people that have a good intention, but building a network, making changes in ways that work in a community like that. Mm -hmm. Really strong. And, And Mary... You went there, and I have to ask you, because I know I found out about their work through Unity when you had them come at Unity, and they will be at Unity this Sunday, 10 o'clock, I assume? Well, let me just do that plug. We'll do it again. They will be at Unity Church on High Street. The service is from 10 to 11. All you Super Bowl people, we will be out of there. You'll be at your (laughs) Super Bowl party. I heard a bunch of people say, no, no, no. Come early. We're going to have all those gift items, and they'll be able to talk story. They're going to tell a wonderful message. But before the service, come get the best items. They'll be set up by 915. Okay. So you and you on. will be at the Super Bowl party. That's Sunday this week, Super Bowl Sunday. Come and have a Super Bowl experience with real people. Yeah. But it's the real thing. I've watched. They live on Social Security. And wow. they they have not taken a di- They've taken living expenses. Wow. They've built a house for them. They, ha- they serve 40 people at a time every morning for breakfast. So even though it's a very big house, it has it, they can sleep 22 people in. This is not like, oh, <laughs> I'm now living. And they do have a pool outside the door, which we have to make sure Denny has his, his uh, – Aqua jacket. How many? How many surge? How much tin or le- metal do you have in you, Denny? He's gone to Mayo Clinic <laughs> ninety one every year. They put more in him. Well, uh, I used to be on the swim team when I was in college, <laughs> and now my real problem is I can't even float because <laughs> I got twenty eight pounds of metal in me. Uh, he just going, goes down. Going through TSA uh, and the metal detector must set off a lot of bells. Is all I can <laughs> no, say. they just they say they just stand here and put your arms above your head. <laughs> zip, zip. Zip, zip. Uh, and so when you went there, and you did went there, and you you talked about it for a long time before. I did. What was your impression? You had never been to Africa before, and you know yeah. it's very different in our minds what we think of Africa. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I remember that movie Out of Africa. But what's the difference in the reality versus our fantasies about Africa, in your opinion? Well, I, I went first from, I took Delta, and so I went into Kilimanjaro. Mm -hmm. I read the book, and I hiked. Well, I didn't hike it. It wasn't open. But saw that, and I then came into them, and I'd just been in Brazil for four months and got healed with John of God. Coming in kind of, um, I'd wanted to get there sooner, so I was coming in a little bit less time. And they pick us up. It's a two-hour drive. They're driving all the time. When she says Dar, down to Dar of Salah, uh -huh. it's a two-plus-hour drive home. And they sit there and wait and pick people up. They've got a place. So what I noticed was, one, you could see graft and corruption. Like, to get into the country, you have to give them a crisp $100 bill. It can't really? be an old well, no, one. That's, it can't. Not, that's not graft. That's your visa. Well, <laughs> but it's a hundred dollar bill. It's not like a check or a bank card. It's a yeah. I wouldn't say it's great. I'm just saying when you give them a hundred dollars yeah. anyway, it's hard to track it, you know. But anyway, the I noticed that nothing but kindness. Really, half of the population are more as Muslim. Any story we have about Christians really? and Muslims, oh, it's most of, around. Well, it's where, a where third. We are. It's a third. Well, where we are, it's it's heavily Muslim, but the country is a third, a third, and a third. Yeah, a I th didn't know that. A third Muslim, a third Christian, and a third tribal traditional. So you have to understand all of those traditions to be able to deal with each and person. honor them and honor them exactly. And love does. See what Denny and Paula do is they have such a deep respect for where a person is. They don't try to convert them. Mm -hmm. They give the best quality service to the poorest of the poor or the wealthiest of the wealth. They are present. And they've built around them. By the time I got to their little piece of heaven, I would say, and I've been to two or three or four places on the planet where the community has created heaven on earth. Because they generous, they've hired for care and kindness. They've got Maasai warriors guarding the property. And really? one of, what did you tell me? <laughs> one of their Maasai, Maasai warriors security. turns out to be a bamboo master. <laughs> so they're putting in a bamboo field and they'll have all bamboo furniture. Oh, and so. you have yeah, this beautiful the Maasai, bamboo cane. The Maasai no, warrior. That? That's wow. Ebony. Oh my yeah. God. Ebony, this cane. This cane is, is magical. An ebony yeah. cane. Everything is like beautifully <laughs> carved and polished yeah. with love. Love, love. That, that yeah, you gotta sell you gotta sell some of those. <laughs> you got to get them aside and make some of those. Those are beautiful. Yeah. I've never seen anything quite like it's that. It's a little hard on radio to see this, but if you come Sunday to High Street on Unity, you can <laughs> see that cane. <laughs> but so I would, I, and kind of yeah. winding this up in the next three minutes here, I, I want to get from you, of course, obviously your motivation is caring and doing something that matters. But were there times where you just really had to get inspired and be touched by the grace of God to in hard situations to keep going and and how did that happen well of course uh it it, it you know there are, <laughs> quite frankly there are days that you get up and you say to each other why do we do what we do and sometimes the answer is because we don't know how to quit mm -hmm. <laughs> an awful that's, lot that's, of that's a good one, an yeah. awful lot of people depend on us mm -hmm. um but then when you see kids running around alive They're that are alive dead. because we've said yes to God, mm -hmm. then you know that there was a time when we only had $35 in the bank, mm. and our our payroll at that time was $15,000 oh a month. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And I went out in my prayer garden, and I've told Mary this. And she admonished me. I said, okay, God. If this is your work, yeah. <laughs> uh, then it's up to you because I can't do anything else. Well, Mary said, yeah, you had to get your ego out of the way. <laughs> and within three weeks, we had $40,000. Wow. That's and, miraculous. That's amazing. And, and a lot of those checks were written before I ever prayed the prayer. And so it's trust God. Yeah. Show up for work. And the love, obviously. I mean, I, I can't even imagine what it feels like to see children's lives you've saved and now long enough to see them coming back, you know, years yeah. later and knowing yeah. that you saved their lives, you know? Yeah. Do it's, they feel like they need to pass it forward, pass it on? From, when, do they? you see them changing their lives yeah. because of their... They, they feel special. Mm. They are special, okay? All children are special. But when they know that... Those people down there had something to do with the fact that you're running around. That's a story. Yeah. That gets told to to their relatives and their families, and, and it, it goes on. Yeah. 
Well, and it's not just the children, Cindy. Everyone they work with carries this loving kindness. It really is heaven on earth. And I, I have work, to thank you so much. We're out of time, Mary. But this Sunday, 9 o'clock, get there early to buy the wonderful, beautiful things that help people. How do people find out about you if they're listening and they can't make it there? Our website is www.ihptz.org. ihptz.org. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ron, for making this show possible.